In this lesson, we're continuing our discussion of present estates and future interests. Specifically, we want to focus on some common law limitations when we're dealing with future interests that are held by a transferee. And specifically, in this lesson, we're going to focus on three major common law doctrines. We have the destructibility of contingent remainders, the rule in Shelley's case, and the doctrine of worthier title. Of course, we still have one major limitation that we're going to still have to think about being the rule against perpetuities. But the rule against perpetuities probably warrants its own video, so we'll get to that in our next lesson. So in this lesson, though, we just want to focus on these three. And fortunately, these doctrines are relatively straightforward, at least compared to the rule against perpetuities. So we want to knock these out first, make sure we have these down, and then we can move on to our final limitation in our next lesson. But we can just jump into it with the destructibility of contingent remainders. Again, important to note that this is a common law doctrine that's been largely abolished today, but if we're applying the common law on a real property fact pattern, we'll want to be familiar with this concept. So under the destructibility of contingent remainders, a contingent remainder is destroyed if it fails to vest when the prior estate terminates. So we can work through an example to see how this plays out. And for all of these, we'll kind of go through an example and see how it would work today under a more modern approach. And we'll see how it works at common law under these different doctrines. Okay. So here, and we talked about this last in our last lesson, right? Two, if I convey Green Acre to Amy for life, then to Bobby and his heirs, if Bobby reaches age 25. Well, we know from our last lesson, right, that Bobby holds a contingent remainder. If we work through our decision tree, right, we would say if the call of the question asks us what you, what interest in Greenacre does Bobby hold? Well, we know our starting point question would be, well, does Bobby have a present estate or a future interest? Because Bobby's interest is non-possessory, right? He needs a future event to happen to gain a possessory interest in Greenacre. We know Bobby holds a future interest. Is Bobby the transferor or a transferee? Here, Bobby's receiving Green Acre, so Bobby would be a transferee. That means his, his interest has to, his future interest, because it's held by a transferee, either has to be an executory interest or a remainder. Well, because this immediately follows a life estate, we know it's going to be a remainder, which leaves us with the question, is Bobby's remainder contingent or vested? Well, because we have a condition precedent, Bobby has to reach age 25 in order to gain his possessory interest in Greenacre. We know Bobby holds a contingent remainder, right? And that's kind of the decision tree that we worked through in our last lesson. But important to recognize that common law, we have another limitation to this idea that we want to think about. So imagine, right, if Bobby does not reach age 25 when Amy's life estate terminates, right? So say one year after, let's say at the time of this conveyance, right, Bobby is 20 years old, and let's say one year later, Bobby dies, right? So I convey Greenacre to Amy for life, then to Bobby and his heirs if Bobby reaches age 25. Well, let's say that one year later, Bobby is 21 years old and Amy dies, right? Well, what happens? Well, in that case, if we apply the destructibility of contingent remainders, here, Bobby's interest has failed to vest when the prior estate terminated. When Amy died, Bobby did not reach age 25. Therefore, Bobby's interest is destroyed. It's terminated. It's extinguished. You can never get it back. Bobby, you know, sorry, Bobby, you're out of luck. Under the destructibility of contingent remainders, if Bobby's future interest fails to vest when Amy dies, right? He hasn't reached age 25 when Amy dies. His interest in Greenacre is completely destroyed, right? Now today, if this same fact pattern happened, right? I convey Greenacre to Amy for life, then to Bobby and his heirs if Bobby reaches age 25, what happens if Amy dies one year after the conveyance, right? Say Bobby is 21 and Amy dies. Well, without the destructibility of contingent remainders doctrine, right? Bobby's future interest is not destroyed. He still holds on to it even when the prior estate terminates. So when Amy dies, 
Bobby holds on to his future interest and he's still going to get Green Acre when he reaches age 25. So effectively what would happen here if I convey Green Acre to Amy for life then to Bobby and his heirs if Bobby reaches age 25 and Amy dies when Bobby is 21 then Green Acre is going to revert back to me, right? And then four years later when Bobby reaches age 25 it's going to go to Bobby. So I'll hold a reversion for four years in Green Acre then when our condition precedent is satisfied and Bobby reaches age 25 he's going to get his present possessory interest in Greenacre because we don't have destructibility of contingent remainders in modern trends today, right? This has been largely abolished. So again, if we're applying the common law principles here and we have destructibility of contingent remainders, if Bobby's remainder fails to vest when the prior state terminates, then his future interest is destroyed in Greenacre. Bobby's interest is extinguished. Right? Today, that's been abolished. Bobby's future interests would not be destroyed. And when he reaches 25, he gets his present possessory interest in Greenacre. So that's destructibility of contingent remainders. Our next limitation that we want to think about here, another common law limitation. Again, this has been largely abolished, but if we're applying the common law, we'll want to be familiar with the rule in Shelley's case. So here, under the rule in Shelley's case, if a conveyance creates a life estate or fee tail in a transferee and also creates a remainder in fee simple in that transferee's heirs, then the future interest belongs to the transferee not the heirs, right? Effectively, what we're going to have here is a merger of that larger interest being the fee simple remainder and that smaller interest being the life estate is going to merge into one estate, which is usually going to be fee simple absolute, and that's going to belong to the transferee, not the heirs. Right, so the way that this would play out is if we had a conveyance like this. I convey Greenacre to Amy for life, then to Amy's heirs. Call of the question asks us what, what interest in Greenacre does Amy's heirs hold? Right, well here we'd work through it again. Question number one has to be, do Amy's heirs hold a present estate or a future interest? Of course, we know that Amy's heirs have a present non-possessory interest, so it would be a future interest. Are Amy's heirs the transferor or the transferee? They're receiving the property, so they would be the transferee. So we know it's either an executory interest or remainder. Here, immediately follows a life estate, so we know it's going to be a remainder. Is it contingent or vested? Of course, we know that Amy's heirs heirs are unascertainable as long as Amy's alive, so it's going to be a contingent remainder, right? That was our discussion of last, or in our last lesson, right? We know from our decision tree that Amy's heirs would have a contingent remainder. However, at common law, we have a limitation or an exception here we have to think about, which is the rule in Shelley's case. Because essentially what we've done, right, we have a conveyance that creates a life estate and a transferee, right, to Amy for life. And also in that same conveyance also creates a remainder and fee simple in that transferee's heirs, right, to Amy for life then to Amy's heirs, right? So Rule and Shelley's case is triggered, which means that the future interest that was created here, this remainder in fee simple, actually belongs to Amy, not Amy's heirs. So the result, if we're applying Rule and Shelley's case, would be that Amy holds fee simple absolute, right? If we're not applying the Rule and Shelley's case, we're just going through our decision tree and what it would be today in almost every jurisdiction. We know that Amy would have a life estate and Amy's heirs would have a contingent remainder. So effectively, another easy way to remember this, right, if you see this and you're applying the rule in Shelley's case, essentially what this is treated as saying is think about it, to Amy for life, then to Amy's heirs, we're essentially just removing this for life bit and it's really like saying, to Amy and her heirs, 
right? Essentially, what we've done is just removed this life estate bit, right? And we're going to treat it as a merger of the life estate into that remainder in fee simple. We merge those together and that estate goes to Amy. So it's like saying to Amy and her heirs, which we know would be fee simple absolute. So rule in Shelley's case, Amy holds Green Acre in fee simple absolute, right? Again, pretty straightforward. You really just want to look out for kind of two elements right here, right? If we have a deed, one instrument, and a conveyance that's going to create a life estate or a fee tail and a transferee, and at the same time creates a remainder in fee simple, and the transferee's heirs, then we get that merger, right? And the transferee is the only one that's getting the interest, right? It's going to merge together, and we're going to say that the transferee which would be Amy here, is going to have fee simple absolute. Okay, again, this is a common law doctrine, is not going to apply today in most jurisdictions. This has been largely abolished. Okay, and finally, our last limitation that we want to think about is the doctrine of worthier title. This may be our simple, our most simple one. Right here, under the doctrine of worthier title, an owner of real property can transfer land to heirs only through the worthier method of descent, which of course is going to be intestate succession, not by means of devise or conveyance. Devise meaning through will, transferring real property through a will. Conveyance meaning transferring real property through a deed. So. What the doctrine of worthier title is saying, and again, largely abolished, this is an old common law rule. This would almost never apply today, but at common law, if we're applying the doctrine of worthier title, an owner cannot transfer land to their heirs through any other means than intestate succession, right? What's considered the worthier method of descent. So it can't be conveyed by means of a will or it can't be transferred. The real property can't be transferred to heirs by a will or a deed. Right, it has to be intestate succession. Of course, intestate succession, we'll talk about that more, it, or you will, in your wills, trusts, wills, estates, class, whatever it's called, right? Wills, trusts, and estates. Intestate succession basically means when a person dies without a will, right? That's dying intestate, and the property is going to pass according to the laws of intestate succession in that jurisdiction. But it just means dying without a will, right? Your property is going to pass then through intestate succession. Okay, all of this a way to say though, basically if we have this type of conveyance to Amy, if I convey Greenacre to Amy for life, then to my heirs, under the doctrine of worthier title, we basically just remove this from the equation, right? And it's just to Amy for life, right? So Amy would hold a life estate and I would hold a reversion, right? So if Amy dies, comes back to me, does not go to my heirs. That's doctrine of worthier title because again, you cannot do that, right? Through a conveyance or a devise, you cannot, the owner of real property cannot transfer land through any other means than intestate succession. So here, you basically just ignore it. If you say to Amy for life, then to my heirs, that bit about to my heirs is going to be ignored under the doctrine of worthier title. Amy is going to have a life estate and I am going to have a reversion. Of course, today, right, again, because this has been largely abolished, we're not going to follow doctrine of worthier title. Here, we would know that Amy has a life estate and my heirs, of course, would have a contingent remainder, right? Heirs would have a future interest, they're held by the transferee, immediately follows a life estate, so we know it's a remainder, and it's contingent because my heirs are not ascertainable as long as I'm alive. So we know my heirs today, we would just go through the decision tree exactly like we talked about in our last lesson, and we would know that my heirs hold, under this conveyance, my heirs hold a contingent remainder, Amy has a life estate, but if we're applying doctrine of worthier title, we know that real property cannot be transferred to heirs through a conveyance, right? It has to be through the worthier method of descent, which is intestate succession. So this would be treated as Amy having a life estate and me holding a reversion because we ignore this to my heirs bit of the conveyance, right? 
That's doctrine of worthier title. So the theme that emerges here, right, under these common law rules, you can see we're putting a lot of limitations on contingent remainders, right? So anytime we see contingent remainders or really any future interest that's held by the transferee, we do want to think about all of these different doctrines, right? We want to think about destructibility of contingent remainders, rule in Shelley's case, and the doctrine of worthier title, right? If we're applying the common law, we know that there's going to be these limitations. If we're not applying the common law, if we're saying what would happen probably today in most jurisdictions, then we just work through the decision tree exactly like we talked about in our last lesson. That is how it's going to happen. That decision tree is how it's going to work in most jurisdictions today, absent the rule against perpetuities, right? Otherwise, though, if we're applying old common law rules that have been largely abolished, you'll keep these in mind, right? And there's still obviously one other very big limitation, one major common law limitation that still has some applicability today, and that is going to be the rule against perpetuity. So again, that'll apply to future interests that are held by the transferee, and we'll talk about that more in our next video. It really warrants its own video. So we'll get there in our next lesson. But until then, guys, I wish you all the absolute best and I'll see you at our next video.